Hey, welcome to the Bioinformatics chat. I'm here with Jacob Schreiber. And Jacob, who's our guest today? Our guest today is Dr. David Kelly. I'm really excited to have him here because I've been following his work for a while. And generally, what I've seen from it, it's pretty high quality. So uh, Dr. David Kelly got his PhD from the University of Maryland and then did a postdoc where he did most of the work that I'm familiar with at Harvard University with uh, Dr. John Wren. Before we talk about that, though, um, you're currently a principal investigator at Calico, and you have a somewhat interesting story with how you ended up there. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, thanks so much, guys, for, for inviting me onto the podcast. Yeah, I mean, Calico is sort of a, a unique research institution. I, I was looking around for the next place to work after the postdoc, and I explored a number of academic positions in universities, and I applied at Calico as well, and it felt a lot like a, a university without some of the downsides, like having to be always thinking about the next grant. And uh, so I, I ended up settling there. So most of the, you're saying that the research that's happening there is mostly funded through external sources. Where does the money come from? Yeah, Calico is funded by both Google and we're one of the Alphabet companies and a pharmaceutical partner, AbbVie. So AbbVie handles all of the downstream translational development if we were to do a clinical trial, it would happen through AbbVie. But, um, you know, we're focused at Calico on sort of early stage research. And for people who are even less familiar with Calico, like maybe you could introduce what, what is it? What does it do? Yeah, so Calico started um, out of a number of folks at Google who were very interested in the aging process and who had a hypothesis that um, by directly researching the aging process, you would be able to find therapies that would reduce your risk of getting multiple aging related diseases, that there's sort of um, core processes in cells and tissues and organisms that uh, contribute to a shared risk of multiple types of diseases. So rather than rather than trying to pick a disease and kind of focus on the symptoms and work back from there to try to find a therapeutic, we start with more basic cell biology, you know, things like the mitochondria, and try to buy, better understand when things go wrong with these basic cellular processes what happens next and what sort of consequences branch out from there. And, um, and the hope is that by coming at it from this, this different angle that we'll be able to find things that, that other people either didn't see or weren't able to pursue because there was um, too much pressure to move a research program quickly towards a therapeutic, whereas because we're funded, stably funded by, by Google, we can take on longer term research projects. Yeah. So how much does this uh, company mission inform your research in, in particular? It informs it quite a bit. I mean, a lot of the research I do is um, trying to understand genome function and to understand how genes are regulated. and Many folks in the field are doing things like pursuing um, more rare disorders, more um, Mendelian type diseases. And the Mendelian disorders can be quite informative for the sort of research we're doing, but we're a little more focused on the diseases and the changes in phenotype that happen to everyone, not just um, a rare few who have, who have mutations. So it gives you a certain anchoring in the aging process, and then you can kind of branch out from there. And you know, I found it I found it quite challenging to understand this incredibly complex aging process. 
but also pretty rewarding knowing that um you know the work we do will influence potentially a lot of people you know it's it's not just a rare few who would benefit but but pretty much everybody so you you've been talking about how calico is working on trying to find a general basis for aging and you've been saying that uh most of the work that you've been doing is computational is all of the work that's being done at calico computational you mentioned that you were partnering with another company to do trials no not at all there's um there's a number of of wet labs based at calico working on a variety of organisms too we have some labs that are focused on on yeast and C. elegans and the naked mole rat is everyone's favorite this uh, long-lived mammal that we often do comparisons with mice that's the closest um, model organism that you could do direct comparisons to but it lives about 10 times longer than a mouse so there's a number of wet labs that are are focused on doing experiments with these these organisms or or working working with um cell lines we have an oncology group as well cancer counts as a as an aging related disease that that makes sense so you were talking about how you were transitioning from being a postdoc into your next position and you were applying to multiple positions including calico what types of freedoms does calico give you versus a more traditional uh say like professor or research scientist like vol at a university yeah the um the philosophy of how we operate at Calico is a uh, bottom-up driven research innovation. So rather than a, a group of secretive, smart researchers collecting in a room and then leaving the room and sending out orders to everybody, you do this, you do that, there's sort of a, a philosophy that the, the best way to tackle a very hard problem of understanding aging or, and being um, open to all sorts of possible types of innovation and, and breakthroughs is to have a lot of smart, capable people who have the resources they need go and explore what is the most interesting approach to them, which is kind of why we have so many different organisms and, and different approaches and, you know, Altogether, it uh, it's quite a portfolio of research that we've assembled. So there's a lot of um, you know there's a lot of bumpers on that. Obviously, we're focused on aging. So if you want to work on something that uh, has absolutely nothing to do with aging, like uh, butterfly wing evolution, you're going to have to justify that <laughs> in some way and probably keep it short. Just say that you're studying the butterfly effect. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you could. You could try, <laughs> but um, you know, other than that, there's quite a bit of um, quite a bit of freedom for at least coming up with ideas. Not never, not everything is going to be fully supported. You know, you you want the support of your your colleagues. So when I come up with an idea, I run it by a lot of people, including lots of people who are more experienced than I am. So there's this nice, um, there's this nice opportunity to to get feedback and sort of sculpt research ideas into into something that makes sense but then from there there's resources to start doing experiments to generate data or to find the right partners that uh, might have that data and get access to it so does calico function as a private research institute or do you have like a commercial arm it tries to develop some services or products. It's it's a company, yeah. It's it's a primarily a commercial commercial arm, commercial enterprise. Oh, so so are you selling something? Like, how does it work? I think you know it's it's similar to other pharmaceutical companies. We hope to come up with therapies and sell those therapies. That isn't happening yet. It seems very much like Bell Labs, where they were prioritizing a lot of very basic research, and some of those ideas ended up becoming major products for them that they made money for and funded the rest of them. Yeah, Bell Labs was a major inspiration for how they set up the the company. When I interviewed David Botstein, has um, 
uh, a book about Bell Labs that he gave to me and I found out later he gives it to everyone. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, the, it, I I read it before I joined because I you know wanted to better understand this um, the philosophy of what they they wanted to do. And yeah, I think it's true. It's I found that it's a it's a little cliche to say you want to be the Bell Labs of this around Silicon Valley. It's like a, kind of an easy reach of a very successful research institute. But I think they've done a nice job of actually trying to understand what worked at Bell Labs and and try to uh, put frameworks in place here, so that we can we can try to have stuff like that happen too. Well, maybe in the future we'll be able to refer to successful biotech research startups as the we'll say that it's the calico of some specific research area. <laughs> yeah, we love that. <laughs> well, thank you for that uh, description of Calico. It sounds super interesting. I know that at, w at one point in my grad studies before deciding that I wanted to fully commit to the academic route, I was trying to decide on what path I wanted to take. And something like Calico certainly was an attractive option. So um, w w let's start talking a bit about what precisely you work on, that you first came onto my radar with your original uh, Bassett paper. That came out in around 2015, I think. That was around the time that I was starting to get into uh, genomics, and so um, and, you know, with the, all the deep learning craze, that anytime anyone applied a neural network to anything, people went, you know, crazy. Uh, but I really liked it because it seemed like a it seemed like an actually like principled thing to try to do, rather than just you know trying to you know deep neural networkify everything. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that initial work? Sure. Yeah. And when I when I started that, it uh, it hadn't quite hit the the it hadn't quite taken off yet in the biology world. And at the time, I was I was working in a lab that was focused on long non coding RNAs, so all these transcripts around the genome that that don't code for proteins. And I was doing a lot of bioinformatic work trying to basically to understand if there were functional domains in those RNAs and thinking about untranslated regions of, of mRNAs as well. Uh, you know, are there binding sites of um, proteins and microRNAs and, and things like that? So I was doing a little bit of sort of string kernel style KMER classification models for things like protein binding to different RNAs. And, you know, at the time, most of the successful models were using kernel methods and support vector machines. And so I was pretty familiar with that. And for years, I, I'd been working in this wet lab. So I was, you know, really focused on learning a little bit more about the, how the biology worked, the molecular biology and what the experiments were. And I sort of hit a point where I was like, okay, I need to I need to go back to the computer science department and hang out a bit. And, and I connected with uh, Ryan Adams' group at Harvard, and specifically one of his uh, postdocs named Jasper Snoke. They had a great meeting where they were sort of talking about some of the cutting edge machine learning stuff that that they were up to. And um, Jasper had already been like slightly thinking about convolutional nets in, in genomics and uh, I sort of helped connect the dots and say, yes, this seems like a, a very reasonable approach. And so initially I was still thinking about RNA, but RNA is a little harder. All the experiments generate slightly noisier data. It's harder to normalize because the, the number of RNA transcripts varies in the cell. Whereas all the DNA assays, you know, there's, there's two locations. Well, most of the time there's two, unless you have some sort of copy number variation. So you just get nice cleaner data. So we said, okay, let's let's focus on um, some of these DNA chromatin data, like the DNA hypersensitivity. And I was very inspired by by Michael Beer's recent paper just before that, his program called GKM SVM that used gap camers and the support vector machine and got really great performance. So I was like, okay, we can try the convolutional net thing tried a bunch of different architectures. Jasper was a real expert in how to do these architecture searches 
he had pioneered an approach using Bayesian optimization to do searches over different hyperparameters of the architecture and the optimization algorithm that you use, sort of like a black box optimization. And so, you know, we hooked that up and we tried a bunch of stuff and we, we set up the data set and, and it worked pretty well. That's pretty interesting. There's that, that, a lot of background to the model that I wasn't aware of. So you, you did all this, and the to clarify, the input to the model was just genomic sequence, just you know the the four nucleotides that had been one hot encoded, and the output were all of these different functional profiles. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what specifically the output of this model was? Yeah, sure. You 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 nailed it. You're you're bringing in a DNA sequence and the sort of spirit of deep learning of working with the neural networks is let's code this in its simplest representation that we can that has all the relevant information and sort of let the neural network take it from there. So you have these four channels coming in representing the A, C, G, and T, and then the length of the sequence, which you choose and which we chose to be, I think initially 500 to 1,000 base pairs which was you know, larger than the size of most of the peaks that you'd call in this data. So we wanted to get a little extra, little extra sequence to see if that mattered. So from there, you have these convolutional filter operations that are processing on the sequence. And you know, probably people are, are mostly familiar with these from, from image analysis at this point. But for, for genomics, it was a really nice because these are basically the same sorts of objects, these position weight matrices that people in bioinformatics had been had been using for years. So you could think of the convolutional net as a generalization of scanning a position weight matrix across the sequence where you basically just learn the weights of the position weight matrix and then you learn some downstream convolution transformations that are able to pick up on things like interactions between between those filters. But then ultimately, yeah, you're making predictions for however many data sets you have annotations for. So, you know, I'm picturing these um, browser tracks from the encode papers where it's just like browser track after browser track after browser track of all of the different data sets that they have. So think of like taking one column of one of these giant genome browser pictures and trying to predict for that position in the genome what is the annotation from all of these different data sets and initially starting with just a, a binary peak annotation so you can just use a binary cross entropy loss. I think your point about how convolutions have this very uh, clear connection to something that already existed in bioinformatics is a great point. That convolutional networks really clicked for me in the context of genomics when I thought of each one. So people are maybe familiar with convolutional networks, like you say, in the context of image analysis, where at the very lowest level of the convolution may pick up like a straight line or like a little like moon shape thing. And then allegedly at each layer in this neural network is supposed to pick up more and more abstract patterns. So that by the time you get all the way through the network, you've taken these raw pixel values and you're able to identify something like this is a dog or this is a cat, or I guess in your case, trying to identify a Basset versus a Basenji <laughs> um, and pick up uh, what are the features there that are different. And so in the context of genomics, like you were saying, that the first layer convolutions rather than being like a line or a moon, they're quite literally just like the log, they can be interpreted as like the log odds ratio of each one of the nucleotides being involved in a motif. Yep. If you know like a protein binds to some length seven motif, one of your convolutions might literally just be that motif. And then the later logic in the network says like, well, this motif is here and this motif is here somewhere else in the sequence. And if they're both here, than this thing. Yep. And and once we were able to train train models that were, were actually getting um, better than random accuracy, getting it actually <laughs> training, of course, took a while. This is sort of notoriously difficult, although I think it's become a lot easier with the the programming frameworks now putting some pretty good bumpers on you. Yeah. What framework did you use originally? Initially, I tried using Theano, which was um, this auto diff library out of 
the University of Montreal. And Theano is this compiled language. It was quite hard to debug. So the initial things I coded, you know, weren't training and I couldn't really figure out why. And so I switched to Torch and had to learn a new programming language along the way. So it's it's in Lua, but luckily Lua is incredibly simple. It's um, you know, I think designed to be that way. And so I picked up a book and and was able to get started reasonably. It was kind of fun actually. I mean, I I said I was a little bit um I don't want to say bored with biology, but I, I was sort of craving uh, getting back to my computer science roots. So doing things like having to learn a new programming language was a little bit of a perk. And so <laughs> coding it up in Torch, then um, you know, it also isn't a great debugging experience, but <laughs> luckily I was able to to get it working. All right, so now we have this model, and it takes in this like one hot encoded sequence, and you run it through all these convolutional layers where you're finding motifs and learning some sort of combinatorial pattern of these motifs. What is the output exactly? You've been talking about like peaks, and you've been talking about binary signal. What precisely were you using in the original Bassett model? Yeah, so the the thing you're trying to predict is this binary vector representing all the different data sets that you that you've got your hands on. So I had about 150. DNA hypersensitivity data sets. So we're measuring accessibility of that site in the genome. And so it's sort of a, it was a nice data type because it involves a variety of different transcription factor binding motifs that were likely to be relevant. So you want to predict this vector of zeros and ones. What you actually have your network output is just a sort of continuous real number but then you squash it with a sigmoid function. So it ends up being a prediction of the probability of there being a peak, peak at each uh, for each data set. So you get this number 0, 1, between 0 and 1, and uh, you compute your loss function against the actual zeros and 1s. I see. So it's basically you're taking in the sequence and you're trying to predict, like, is it accessible? Is this available to the outside world versus very compressed? Exactly. And so you're saying that you have multiple data sets. Why isn't it not just the case that either a region is accessible or not accessible? Yeah, it's, it differs across cell type. I mean, that's sort of the, uh, the problem that we're up against is that although it's the same DNA in every cell, there's uh, different behavior of that DNA and different genes expressed in every cell and every situation that that cell encounters. And so the DNA's hypersensitivity and, and also ATAC-seq, another assay for measuring accessibility, are just a really nice readout of the sort of um, global gene regulatory programs that are, are running. Like if there's a transcription factor that's binding a certain motif and... Um, either driving the opening of the chromatin or just um, sort of piggybacking on other factors that are that are doing that, then you're going to see that motif unrich, enriched under these, um, under these peaks in the signal. And so if you have uh, some blood cell types versus brain cell types, there's going to be regions in the genome that are consistently accessible. Usually these are things like housekeeping gene promoters, genes that are on in just about every cell. And things like um, the protein CTCF is pretty pretty consistent across, across all the different cell types. But then you're going to have some transcription factors that are either specific to the brain cells or brain tissue profiles versus blood versus anything else you have. And those will drive... Um, cell type specificity that you're hoping to predict. And so how do you resolve this uh, contradiction that the DNA is the same in every cell, yet the accessibility is different or the phenotype profiles are different, right? Uh, do you have some extra input that informs the model about which cell type are we're working with? The only thing the model is getting is... Um, you know, for each data set, it's, it's an index in this vector that you're trying to predict. So I'm trying to predict 150 different cell types. So it, it doesn't know that the 30th element in the vector represents this cell type, and it doesn't know anything about that program. But 
as I'm showing it sequence after sequence after sequence and I'm training the model, it's sort of implicitly learning that. And actually, at the end, the last layer of weights is going to transform this sort of vector representation of your sequence into the final predictions. And if you take that weight matrix and flip it around, then you have all your cell types by parameters in the model. And you can actually cluster that and start to see these relationships between the cell types that cell types are very similar. will have similar parameter vectors in that last layer of the model. So, you know, to, to try to answer your question, yeah, the DNA is the same, but all of the other proteins that are interacting with the DNA are slightly different. So the nucleosomes are modified in different ways in different cell types. There are all sorts of histone modifications and there are um, methylations to the DNA itself at CPG sites that are going to be different across cell types. They're different because proteins like transcription factors at some point in the history of the cell were present and sort of created that difference. So even though we don't directly model that in, in something like the, the Bassett model, we're hoping that the sort of history of the cell is still available in the sequence enough to get enough information to make reasonable predictions. But mostly you're picking up on the active transcription factors in that cell type that are at the moment directly binding to the DNA. That's pretty cool that often we think about neural networks as these uh, black box models, but every time someone manages to somehow interpret this coefficients in a in a clever way, as you said, with the with the final layer, right? As like telling us something about cell types. I, I find this very cool. Yeah. It was uh, very reassuring when we first got the model training to start looking at those filters in the first layer and starting to look at the DNA sequences that were activating them and noticing that they were they looked very similar to position weight matrices in our transcription vector databases, suggesting that we're we're picking up on on real biology. And over the years since, people have come up with increasingly sophisticated and effective ways of interpreting these models to do things like annotate the nucleotides of the genome and discover new transcription factor binding motifs that the the convolutional net's discovering and to pick up on things like interactions between transcription factor binding sites that are sort of deep within the layers of this deep neural network. And, you know, it's not it's not easy to read that stuff out. It requires these post-processing statistical techniques or sometimes designing your model architecture differently if you really have a specific goal in mind. But these things are are becoming increasingly available in genomics. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think that these types of interpretation methods are incredibly valuable and just beginning to be adopted in biology. So the, to go back to the model, just to clarify that it sounded like you were, you were you gave two good answers to two separate questions there. The first is, um, what is the precise output of the model? And so your model, the Bassett model, takes in sequence, and rather than making one prediction for each sequence, it's making over 100 predictions for each sequence, which is the accessibility in each one of these over 100 cell types. So it's basically like a multitask model, and that's how you handle all of the different cell types. The second is, why do cell types differ? Like, why do we have different cell types? And all the things you were mentioning about the fact that there are all these cell type specific histone modifications and protein binding activities. Like, I don't think we have time in this you know, episode to go into all of the basis, but everything you mentioned is incredibly important in trying to understand that, which is one of the reasons why I like this paper, because it helps us begin to understand all of those things. Uh, yeah, I mean trying to not just map out these uh, different annotations on the genome, but to understand how the DNA sequence determines them is, is really the, the driving objective of the research to get to that, get to that next layer of understanding of, of 
how the DNA exerts its function. One of the things I really liked about it, you know, I'm just lavishing praise on you, but it's because I really enjoyed the work when I first saw it. That one of the things I really liked on it about it is that, as you mentioned in one of your papers, that, uh, and you know, you're not the only person to mention this, that like the function of every cell is basically determined by its gene expression values. That those are the things that drive it. But then the question arises, as I kind of alluded to, why do we have? Where do these different? How are these gene expression values controlled? How do they, why do they differ? And what you're getting at here is trying to understand the units that help control gene expression, the binding of proteins, you know, transcription factors, which literally affect transcription, it's in the name, um, and all of these other things. And so I think that that takes us to your second model, that you started off with Bassett and then you moved on to Basenji. Do you want to talk a little bit about how Basenji differs from Bassett? Yeah, sure. So the inspiration there was um, that ultimately researchers study things like DNA hypersensitivity and all of these chromatin modifications in order to understand how they relate to, to gene expression. That ultimately the abundances of the RNA are sort of uh, um, an information bottleneck. Like you want to go from DNA to protein. And the RNA abundances are um, are a key step in in getting there. And if two cells by slightly different means get to the same RNA abundance profile, well, you know they're they're probably capable of doing this more or less the same thing. So the goal was to to think about how these sorts of models could could work towards predicting RNA abundance levels. And that's a much harder problem because um, now you're no longer you're you're no longer concerned with just the local sequence, but in some cases having to take in an incredibly broad range of of DNA sequence. It's not just the promoter at the transcription start site of the gene that you have to be worried about, but all sorts of distal regulatory elements, things like enhancers, which can be um, often 10 KB away, sometimes 100 KB, occasionally maybe a million base pairs away. So we thought, okay, well, there are, are all these other types of models that people are using in the deep learning literature. And at the time, I was, I was really interested in the recurrent neural networks. That felt like it made a lot of sense for DNA. So the convolutional neural network is great for images where you have a sort of finite um, shaped grid structure and you can scan these, these convolution filters across it. And RNN is built for processing sequences, which can be a variable length. And it's sort of, I sort of picture it as like almost a Pac-Man where it's, um, it's sort of processing each incoming element of the sequence and updating its hidden state and trying to learn everything it can from the sequence as it proceeds across. So I thought, okay, well, if I take a, a really big sequence and, and then I process it with an RNN and I you know, try to predict all of the regulatory attributes across the sequence, then maybe that'll get me closer to being able to predict the gene expression. So the second problem in there is that most of the RNA profiles that we have are through RNA-seq. So RNA-seq, you're sort of capturing all the RNA, reverse transcribing it to DNA, fragmenting it, sequencing it. So you get reads that are all across the transcript. The problem there is that the reads are um, coming from usually a spliced transcript. Sometimes the span of the gene is incredibly large. So it seemed sort of uh, unreasonable to ask any sort of deep learning model to like predict um, exons and coverage on exons and you know just thinking about how to set that problem up didn't quite feel right. So because of um, specifically because of of working in this long non-coding RNA group at the time, I was very familiar with a, a consortium called Phantom that had generated hundreds and hundreds of human tissue and mouse tissue and cell lines using uh, an alternative RNA abundance profiling assay called CAGE. Uh, 
So with CAGE, the, the signal for the RNA abundance is, is specifically located at the five prime site of the gene. So you're basically, you're capturing transcripts, you're identifying the um, specific signals on the five prime end of the RNA, and you're designing a clever sequencing assay off that. So that felt a lot more tractable to me because um, now all of the thing I need to predict is right at the promoter. It's you know all of the all of the reads that I'm sequencing from this RNA are are located at the promoter, so I don't have to think about splicing or where the transcript ends or rely too much on the gene annotation. In fact, you wouldn't have to rely on the gene annotation at all. So the way I set up the problem was to take all of these cage data sets, and you know at that point I said, well, why don't I just throw in all of the data sets that I have laying around, which was all the encode data and epigenomics roadmap data, so all sorts of other types of uh, chromatin profiles. And so now we're going to take a broad sequence, and now you can really directly think of these genome browser plots where you have the, um, the wiggle tracks across the sequence, and we're going to directly try to predict those, those wiggle tracks. And I'm going to do that by choosing a resolution to bin that data, which I chose 128 base pairs as um, you know a number that that felt felt about right based on other people's work. It's a power of two. Yeah, it's a power of two. Um, and so the problem is, given this long sequence, can we predict all of these different data sets in these bins across the genome? So if I understand correctly, the cost of using uh, the cage data instead of RNA-seq is that you are dealing with much shorter um, sequences that are potentially more ambiguous when, when mapping to the genome. Did that uh, present a problem? Yeah, if you wanted to just do gene expression profiling, usually people stick with the RNA-seq because you can get yourself a little more confused about which gene you're sequencing a read for with uh, the cage technique. Um, I mean, if you're getting like if you're getting reads all throughout the transcript, it becomes less ambiguous exactly which RNA you're sequencing. But in this case, that was just a a trade off that was that was I was willing to make. It may be, I mean, yeah, the, there's not many other groups that are doing the cage assay or or five prime assays like it, and so I think probably there's just other technology challenges it's more expensive or something it seems like though uh you were kind of expanding everything that previously you took in like a 1 kb window uh and now you're taking in 131 kilopaces so significantly expanding the input to your model the number of outputs is expanded you're going from like the 150 the small number of hundred of DNA tracks to basically everything you could get your hand on with the primary goal of being able to predict the subset of those that are cage tracks. Uh, and then not only do you have more, instead of trying to predict a single value for each one of those assays, you are predicting, you know, basically like the whole track except binned at 128 base per resolution. So for each one of you, it's basically like instead of trying to predict a vector, you're trying to predict a whole matrix. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've made it more complicated in uh, several different ways. <laughs> <laughs> and we also, yeah, we moved from, for all the chromatin data, like the DNA, so we moved from doing binary peak classification to regression of the, the signal. So it's really sort of counting on there being a little more information available in those tracks that, you know, compressing it to a zero one, while in many cases you're, you're like, trying to identify a safe set of peaks to consider as regulatory regions. Here, it felt like, mm, I don't really need to be that conservative. Like, uh, I don't have an issue with, you know, false positives. I'm not, I'm not really going that road. I just want this model to be able to extract as much information from the data annotation track as possible. So... I move towards the regression thinking that like, you know, okay, if this is a peak and that's a peak, but this one has five times more reads, then maybe that's really important, especially if it's coming from a, uh, 
a tissue where there's a heterogeneous set of cell types. So five times more reads might mean that it's um, it's accessible in all of those cell types, whereas the the less coverage might be just one of several cell types that has that site. So there, it just seemed like there was more information to take advantage of there. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense to me. I remember listening to the um, protein structure prediction model, deep uh, zero, whatever, alpha zero. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the name, but you, 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 know, you probably alpha know fold. it. Yeah, alpha fold. <laughs> alpha zero was the game playing one. Alpha zero plays plays games, yeah. I mean, protein the folded is a game. Yeah, yeah. I'd probably be good at that. I remember listening to them and they were talking about how one of the major improvements in their model came from instead of using binary distance matrices, saying like these amino acids are close to each other, actually using the distances and trying to predict the distances themselves rather than just are these close. And it sounds like Basenji is similar in that vein. Yeah, I think it fits with the spirit of other successes people have had with neural networks where you you want to give this very general architecture all of the information that you have and just sort of let it figure things out from there you know if a certain if a certain pattern of coverage is noise versus real signal then you know by looking at the underlying sequence it's going to sort of tease that out that's the hope so you were mentioning that one of the motivations behind modeling this much larger input sequence is that you were anticipating that it was important to model these distal regulatory elements, that if there was an enhancer that was very far away, you wanted to be able to include that. And if you used just a 1KB window, you, you literally would not be able to. So one of the things you did in your model was that you moved past simple convolutional layers. Do you want to talk about that a little? Yeah. So I mentioned that you know when I first whiteboarded out this idea, I was pretty sure that we were going to use RNNs and specifically this variant of the RNNs called a LSTM that's better at handling distances. And so I played around with that for a while. And the problem was it's a lot more computationally intensive to work with RNNs. So right away, I had to start with convolutions and pooling to take the sequence length down because <laughs> otherwise doing an RNN on 100,000 nucleotides is um, beyond what people do in, in natural language processing with these RNNs. So, you know, that, that just wasn't working that well. And so I started exploring other alternatives. And what I ultimately found that worked quite well was a different style of convolution called a dilated convolution, which folks in both image analysis as well as natural language processing had also had some, some success stories with. So the idea with the dilated convolution is that you're going to basically, rather than have the convolution filter uh, look at adjacent positions in the sequence, you're going to introduce gaps into it and you're going to be looking at it's easiest for me at least to think of a, a width three convolution. And so rather than looking at three adjacent positions, the the two two sites on the sides are going to be looking further and further away. So you're going to be looking at a center position as well as something that's um, one space away or two spaces away or four spaces away or eight spaces away. And by doing a series of layers, that have this dilation rate, which is the basically the size of the gaps in the filter, increase at an exponential rate, you can very efficiently share information across the sequence. So each position in the sequence is now able to, I think of it as like a communication mechanism where it's like, it's able to see positions in the genome that are quite far away and it's not seeing every position that's far away. It's only seeing the one that is, um, you know, two to the tenth power away, or something like that. Um, but if if each position in the genome, which is represented by a vector within the neural network, has enough information about its local region, then maybe that's sufficient. So if there's a distant enhancer and my dilated convolution hits not exactly at that position, but nearby it, then hopefully I can still get that, that information sharing where I can say, hey, 
we've got an enhancer over here and communicate that to the um, other places around the sequence and specifically promoters to try to capture that information. And the dilated convolutions add very little computational overhead. And so that was a really nice perk. Do you mean compared to a convolutional net or compared to nothing? Compared to, so way, way cheaper than the RNNs. And then compared to the Bassett model, which is just a sort of tower of convolutions and max pooling, basically I'm doing that same thing, but now I'm adding these dilated convolutions on top of that. And the extra extra computation on top is uh, it's pretty minimal. That's cool. That's really cool. It seems like a really efficient way of being able to aggregate information over long distances. I've noticed as well that trying to train an RNN or a LSTM that, you know, that going through a sequence in an RNN manner is inherently sequential. And so there's a limit to the amount of parallelization that you can do. I mean, that's in the like NLP field. That's why they're starting to move over towards transformers because transformers are an architecture that can be inherently more parallelizable than these simple RNNs. So it makes total sense that you would have difficulty with them there. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, you you can kind of think of the RNN as as deep in the length of the sequence because the computation, it's sort of like taking the deepness of the neural network and flipping it. So now it's going across the length of the sequence. So if you have to take gradients across the length of the sequence, then yeah, it becomes quite intense. So often people truncate the gradients, but then you know you're not getting quite the same benefit and it's still pretty expensive. Right. People have a tendency to say, oh, DNA is a sequence, therefore RNNs. But the truth is none of the biology is treating the genome as a sequence. None of it's like, oh, I'm going to go to nucleotide one and see what it is, then nucleotide two. The protein saying like, you know, this motif is here in this formation. And so I can bind to this motif in its entirety. Yeah, it's true. I, I did go on a kick though, where when I was deep in the RNNs, I was looking up some of the biophysics models for how transcriptions, how transcription factors find their binding sites. And one of the models is that they sort of latch on to DNA randomly and scan across the sequence. So I thought, oh, wow, that kind of looks like an RNN. So it's, it's, it's not totally crazy, but you know, it's, it's really hard if something doesn't work to figure out exactly why, you know, it could be that there's some setting of the hyperparameters or, you know, some slight modification to the architecture that would just unlock incredible accuracy. But, um, you know, these negative results are all caveated with, it didn't work for me this time with this programming toolkit. Well, all you need is just a massive model and Google scale GPU resource, TPU resources. Sorry. <laughs> Doesn't hurt. <laughs> okay. So now at this point, you have this big model and you've shown that it's been able to make predictions for these massive numbers of tracks. But it's, it seems like the predictive task isn't your primary objective. You're never going to have a case where you have some new, there isn't going to be like a new human chromosome that you want to profile and make predictions for. What is the goal? That, like, what, what are you doing once you have this trained model? Yeah, so another interest I gained in my postdoc that I've carried with me is to to better understand how genetic variants change phenotypes in human populations. So this is a, a quite fascinating area of bioinformatics, in my opinion. You know, we we're in the process of maybe we'll see mapping genomes for everyone on earth and you know everyone will will have their genome if they want it maybe people don't want it but that's an incredible resource you know no other species is going to be mapped out the variation in the population of no other species will be will be mapped like that so that seemed like something to um pay attention to and to to try to try to work with and as resources like the UK Biobank and other biobank projects around the world have started to come online and release their genotypes as well as tied to disease outcomes and health records and things like that, it's just this really incredible opportunity we have to, especially for 
a company like Calico that's interested in common diseases that are really well represented in these databases, it's a great opportunity. So the one of the many problems that this field faces, or not problems, but like bottlenecks to being able to really effectively use human genetics to treat disease, common diseases, is that a lot of the associations that we see in populations with disease fall in non-coding regions. So when you have a, a variant in the genome that changes a coding gene and people with this mutation are more likely to get the disease than people who have another one, that's a, a pretty pretty good hint that you should be paying attention to the function of that gene and try to figure out you know, what, what role in the disease it has. If the correlated variant or sort of set of correlated variants, often there's um, there's a block that that comes along with this, are in a non-coding region, then you have a slightly harder challenge. You don't know exactly what gene and you don't know exactly what cell type the expression of that gene might be might be changed in. And maybe there's multiple genes and maybe there's multiple cell types, and you really just sort of pointed towards a vague region in the genome. So, the um, one of the driving goals of this sort of research program of having machine learning models that can make predictions about arbitrary DNA sequences for all of these things we care about is that you can then on the computer introduce any sort of mutation or modification to the sequence that you want. So, you could take all of these genetic variants in the population and make a prediction for the haplotype with one allele, the haplotype with another allele, and take a look at what the model thinks is changing. And if uh, if you get lucky, then it's going to tell you, oh, in these cell types, there's a change in you know these different active histone modifications and DNAs, and it's going to change expression of this gene. And you come away with a, a good hypothesis to go then design some experiments around to to see, okay, you know, it's, the model thinks that this gene is involved. So let, let's start to explore that. That's really, that's really cool. Uh, you know, like you say that if, because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a computer model that you can just go and you can just say like, okay, I make a prediction for this normal human sequence. And then what if I flip an A to a T? You can still make predictions. There's no limitation there. And so for any potential variant, you can just go and say, what is the effect across all of these thousands of data sets that I can now make outputs for? So then once you look at some variant that is thought to potentially be uh, associated with a disease and you get these predictions, what do you what do you do with them? The next stages of validation are are still not trivial, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, the um the tools that we have at our at our disposal are are getting better and better. I mean, what you'd like to do is go, you know, maybe take a cell line that's a really good representation or some sort of organoid culture, something like that. Some sort of, um, you know, simple model, simplified model of the tissue or disease and work with a genome that has one allele versus the other to try to, to try to test that. So if you have like, you know, a cell line and you know the reference genome, and then maybe you can go in with CRISPR and, Ideally, you would just make the exact mutation that you know, you're making predictions about, so you could test that. Often, what people are end up having to do is introduce um, as small a deletion as they can of the local variant region, and and you know that's pretty compelling too. It's not the exact mutation, but if you take out that whole little motif and you see the same sort of effect, then you're on the right course. So that's really, it's just a limitation of the sort of genome editing tools that we have. But it's also non-trivial because you really have to be thoughtful about matching the um, model system. You know, you have to have a cell line or you have to have something that's representative of the, the tissue that you care about. So, you know, for things like the neurodegenerative diseases, there's lots of GWAS associations and, and people are making great progress on understanding them, but the validation is a little harder. You know, we, we don't have great, there are some 
some brain organoid systems and where you can go into a mouse and if there's a homologous region you can you can maybe get a, get away with doing a validation there but it's um it's still not easy that makes sense that any time you have to get involved with actually growing something with a mutation and validating it it's uh it's Unfortunately, doing wet lab experiments is not yet as easy as doing dry lab experiments, which is why I switched from the wet lab into the dry lab. Yeah, I'm hoping that uh, as we do enough of these validation experiments, everyone will start to trust the machine learning models so much that we don't need to do them anymore. But <laughs> we're, not, we're not quite <laughs> that there. That seems unlikely. <laughs> so I guess my question was, um, certainly the points that you brought up are very important, but I guess what I meant more is like, uh, when you put in a mutation, presumably there'll be some cases where the mutation won't really change the predictions that much. But there'll be other cases, like if it's you know right in the middle of an important enhancer, that you could severely affect the expression of a gene. Did you find that you were able to do things like find these types of long-range interactions by um, basically like confirm which ones were functional and which one didn't really do anything using Basenji? So the the ability of the model to to take into account distal sequence in making its predictions was, um, I think it fell a little short of, of what I hoped to accomplish. You know, we, we left for future work being able to act or accurately predict 100 KB enhancer interactions. I mean, ultimately, the dilated convolutions, while they're very efficient and they did share information across the sequence, maybe on the order of 10, 10 KB, they um, still aren't really capable of precisely predicting these long-range interactions. And partially it's because, you know, ultimately you're just looking at this region of, of DNA and the gene expression predictions and some of these annotations. You're, you're not giving it any sort of training data that tells it that, there's an interaction happening. So it really just has to pick up on these correlations using pretty subtle information. So in some of our, you know, upcoming future attempts, we're trying to make use of some of the other data that folks in the functional genomics field have been able to obtain that more directly measure these sorts of distal interactions, hoping that by giving the model a little bit more information, it'll be able to more effectively learn to pick out these these distant interactions. That makes sense. That by training it simply on like the reference genome and all these functional tracks, there's a lot of information in there and it's very difficult for it to focus on the effect that any individual nucleotide might have. Do you want to talk a little bit about that or your future work or is that still under wraps? Well, one one paper that we we have had on the bioarchive for maybe about a year is working with a postdoc at UCSF named Jeffrey Fudenberg. Jeff has been working on the high C assay to measure the three dimensional contacts of the genome. So, high C is this amazing assay we've had for for years to map out how the chromosomes fold inside the cell. Jeff likes to say. Uh, you know, if you stretched out the DNA, I forget the distance. It's some very large distance. You know, you've heard these sorts of things. If I stretched out the DNA, it would go to the moon or I, I don't know if that's right, but it would be very far. But it fits inside of this tiny, tiny cells. So how does that work? Well, of course, it's extremely compressed and packed in. And um, all of these sort of distal regulatory interactions that I hope the Basenji model can learn the best hypothesis we have right now is that they're facilitated by three-dimensional co-localization of the enhancer sequence, which is very far, with the promoter sequence. So even though they're not near each other in 1D linear chromosomal space, that they do come together in, in 3D space. So with Jeff, we, we trained some convolutional net architectures that were able to directly work with the high C data. So the generalization there is that now we're no longer just predicting one dimensional annotations, we're predicting this two dimensional annotation of the contact frequencies between places in the genome. And uh, you know, 
we weren't really sure initially if that was going to work at all. And of course, just like the initial Bassett stuff, it didn't work for many months until one day, you know, you find the you find the pre-processing transformation and training optimization hyperparameters and boom, it takes off. And so now we have this model that can predict the 3D contacts of a one megabase region of sequence in the genome. And similarly to all of the other models, if you have any sort of mutation to the sequence, um, nucleotide mutations up to larger structural variants, you can make a prediction for how those would affect the three-dimensional contacts. So that, that's really cool that you're saying that one of the ways you can try to get it to focus on these long-range interactions is by making it explicitly predict them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and you know it's it's a neat architecture actually in the end because we ended up borrowing even more tricks from the deep learning of images field, which is you know where most of the innovation is is happening in the conferences at least uh, because you go from this 1d thing and you at some point have to turn it into a 2d thing but now it's a 2d now you're in image land so you can do all the same tricks that they do of course images are basically just Im you know high c experiments are just images of the cell yeah with this uh nice um you know symmetrical across the diagonal properties so it's sort of like uh each of the layers is sort of like taking two views at each place. It's looking at position I to J as well as position J to I independently. And then, you know, we can do things like take the average of them in order to get a little mini implicit en ensemble inside the model. And so do you anticipate that with work like that, you'd be able to identify the, you know, the effect that single nucleotide variants would have on overall 3D structure? Yeah, so in, in some of the analyses later in the paper, after we show that this uh, this thing works at all, we do some analysis of that, mainly focusing on the GTEx data and trying to look at genetic variants that have been pinpointed as EQTLs that affect gene expression in some way. At this point, that's that's just a really high quality data set, and and knowing that something affects gene expression is sort of a a good sign that it, well, a good sign if you care about figuring out how that variant might affect disease. A bad sign if you have the variant and an important distinction. Yeah, and so we were able to you know do do some analyses where we show that. When the model predicts that the variant has a greater influence changing 3D structure, it's more likely to be in EQTL. That makes sense. Simple stuff, but <laughs> it's sort of the, the first first things you need to, to check as you go towards uh, <laughs> interpreting these models and the predictions they make for, for sequences. One thing I, I wanted to, to ask you about uh, was... Um... In the papers, you mentioned causality uh, quite a few times, and I think I see where that's coming from. That's basically what you and Jacob mentioned, that you can uh, just flip the nucleotide and see the new prediction for that nucleotide. At the same time, I'm wondering whether this is like extrapolating correlations to, to causations, or like how, how do you think about this distinction? Yeah, the um, causality is something I've been forced to be a lot more rigorous with now that I'm working at Calico, working on aging, because you know you take an aging organism and you me measure basically anything and it changes. And so you really have this major problem of like, all right, correlations are abundant and ubiquitous and really we need to work out the the causal graph here, if we want to have any hope of coming up with an intervention that has the outcomes that we want. So genetics is nice in this regard because you can pretty safely make an assumption that a genetic variant was not caused by anything. You know, there may be situations where <laughs> you have somatic mutations, but you know, even that is mostly a random process. So it's just sort of caused by uh uh, rolls of dice somewhere. But at, at the same time, you have this problem where uh, 
you know, nucleotides themselves, they don't cause each other, but they're correlated, right? And you have to figure out, like, this is the typical problem in GWAS is that uh, you have this linkage uh, between nucleotides. Yeah, right. So even though the genetic variant is not caused by anything like a disease, you still have these strong correlations of nearby variants in the population, linkage disequilibrium. And so when you have a GWAS association, you're usually pulling along many variants that are correlated with the one that you measured on your you know, microarray or, or something like that. So this is a major challenge for genome-wide association studies, and it's a problem that I hope to be able to contribute to resolving with these sorts of tools because if you're finding an association and you have, let's say, you know, 10 variants that are pretty correlated with uh, your association and the population, so you don't know which of these 10 variants is, um, is the causal variant, the one that you should be really paying attention to when you want to design those, those follow-up experiments. So, you know, one, one way people find map these things is in coding regions is just by saying like, okay, this, this variant adds a stop codon in the middle of a protein coding gene. So, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a good Bayesian about this, I'm going to say that has a very strong prior probability of having a phenotype. And so you can even explicitly build a Bayesian perspective into these fine mapping models and say, using different functional annotations, like introducing a stop codon, you can have a high prior on certain variants and try to tease out using your data um, what a what a posterior probability of being the causal SNP is for each of those 10 variants. So with the non-coding stuff, you know, we don't have annotations that are quite as strong and compelling as introducing a stop codon, but we can still try the same sort of exercise by um, saying that, okay, of these 10 variants, this one is, uh, you know, looks like it's in a silenced domain. This one's in a repeat and it doesn't look very interesting. This one is in... Um, you know, is quite far from any genes. But this one is, you know, within the realm of a gene, maybe it's about 10 KB away, and it's in a DNA's, DNA's hypersensitivity site, and it has active chromatin marks. And so our prior probability of thinking that that might be the causal variant can start to increase. So what the tools that I've been building can layer onto that is not just being able to look at those annotations and how the variants overlap with the peaks called in that data, but also try to assess whether the machine learning model thinks that the variant is likely to be a driver of that annotation. You know, for, any, for every enhancer, maybe you have a 200 nucleotides that look like they're sort of part of the enhancer region, and maybe it's the case that only, you know, a quarter of those nucleotides are actually relevant that you know if you if you mutated them they would change the function in some way so the models can hopefully add a little more precision and specificity to these annotations that we can feed into fine mapping approaches to try to identify causal variants and uh, you know if we're going to do these validation experiments anyway we really just need to get it down to a few candidates that will go and and test in the lab I think that's a that's a really interesting point that I think that being able to basically just plug the output of Basenji into these already existing frameworks to you know allow them to work as if they were in like a coding region is incredibly persuasive. While you were talking, I remembered another question that I had wanted to ask, and it's somewhat technical related to the training of Basenji. That my understanding is that you're basically using a Poisson loss because you're trying to predict these count data the number of reads at each position along the genome, right? But um, each one of these tracks is going to have a different dynamic range in terms of the amount of, you know, the, just the amount of counts, the sequencing depth, uh, or how concentrated it is at a particular region. Did you find that the different dynamic ranges across these, basically like trying to optimize a global 
objective, like Poisson loss, averaged over every position in that output matrix, uh, gave you any artifacts in the prediction or caused any problems? Yeah, I, it's a good good question. It's something I've I've worried about a fair amount. So I've tried different ways of normalizing the tracks. You know, if you have um, if you have say all tracks from one assay, then you can maybe pretty reasonably get away with something like a quantile normalization and enforce that the distributions of values across the genome would be the same for all of your different data, and then you'd be in a pretty you'd be in a much safer place in terms of the dynamic ranges of, of each of the tracks. The, the ranges would be the same uh, in that case. For something like the, the cage versus the other assays, that's where the, the biggest challenge comes in because the you know, cage can range from zero up to you know, having a thousand reads at one promoter, something like that. And, and it's also just a function of the sequencing depth of the experiments. So I've tried lots of different ways of normalizing these data before feeding them into the neural network. And it's amazingly robust to naive normalizations or no normalization. So, you know, at some point you want to normalize because ultimately if you want to make predictions and be able to say something like the variant is more functional in the brain versus the blood, then you, you got to get these things calibrated to each other to make these relative comparisons. But, um, you know, the multitask training procedure is, is fairly robust. There's a fair amount of research ongoing in the ML conferences about how to, how to do multitask learning well. In many cases, they're focused on more complex situations. Like if you have a a self-driving car, then you have, you know, many, many, many different tasks happening at once working with the same data. And so in that case, it's even worse. You know, you have incomplete data, you know, you're only getting some annotations for this task versus that task in, in certain settings. And this might be a classification task and that's a regression and it's just all over the map. And so I, I I read these papers with interest to see if I can steal any uh, ideas, <laughs> but not, nothing has really mattered that much so far. It's an interesting point to think about how, even though it seems like the output from Basenji is incredibly complex, and it is, there are other situations that people are dealing with right now that are so much more complex that people are actively working on. Yep. Yeah. I mean, we, in some ways we have it nice in genomics, every assay pretty much annotates the whole genome and, and and you're good to go. And you have these like processing pipelines that have been developed that handle all the data for you and everything's perfect. You don't have to worry about anything because nothing ever goes wrong in genomics. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you have um, people like Anshul Kandaji at Stanford who's put a ton of work into developing his uh, blacklist of the genome of of regions that have been problematic for for different downstream assays. So, yeah. And he he got that by like literally just scanning through the genome browser and it took him days <laughs> uh, manually going through and yeah. annotating these regions that were weird had weird mapping artifacts. <laughs> yeah, they're out there. I, I, I've seen signs of them too. I have not dedicated myself to uh, to comprehensively annotate them in the way that he has, but I greatly appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, same. Great. Well, thank you again for joining us, Dave. This was a really insightful conversation for me and hopefully other people got uh, just as much as I did out of it or more. Yeah, thank you. Really enjoyed it. 